Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, today we are going to talk about the world of visual culture. All this while we have been briefly mentioning about visuals in one way or the other. We have talked about the significance of uh, visuals in the context of presentations. We have talked about uh, the relevance of multimedia as well, but we are going back to all that again today in this particular context, because it is perhaps very, very important to delve deep into the subject of visual culture. Why is it that we are making use of visuals today to such a significant extent? Now, if you have to answer this question, probably we need to look a little deeper into how technology has changed, how our world has changed, how we look at the world, how we experience the world. And understanding these things will definitely go a long way in developing sensitivity to the use of visuals. So, in today's talk, our focus will be on after the introduction, the relevance of visual culture, changing role of visuals in our culture, the key features of visual culture that would be relevant in the context of soft skills uh, followed by the references. So, here we go. Now, I will be talking about these figures again and again, but uh, if you look at these figures, uh, this particular figure, you find that uh, certain things look convex to us and certain things look concave to us. Okay. Now, the point is that if you ask this question, why is it that such a thing happens? Probably, it will not be very easy to answer this question easily, because obviously, the object that objects that you saw were neither convex nor complex, uh, concave. They were on a plane surface. They were photographs or the objects that you saw was inside a photograph on a plane surface. So, why is it that we experience this kind of a thing? This is one dimension of visuals. Here is another example of another image. The first one on the left hand side is a Chinese script which we read from the top to the bottom and the other one is an Arabic script which we read from the left to the right. What are the implications of the way we read things? on the way we look at things. Now, this becomes very relevant in the context of advertising, because this relates to what is known as scanning bias, how we scan objects, in which direction we move, how do we move from one side to the other side or from the top to the bottom. How does that relate to the way we experience meanings of things when they are linked to one another. This is something which we will highlight when we look at the relationship of images, texts and music, the oral side which we will be dealing with in the next few classes, but these are also relevant. If you are looking at uh, this image, you find that uh, uh, it is not a square frame, but uh, within a circle. Now, what is the significance of a circular frame as opposed to a square or a rectangular frame? What is a frame for that matter? What function does it play? Because framing is something within which we start looking. The moment we have a frame, we tend to look within the frame rather than outside the frame. When we break a frame, what happens? You are looking at me through a computer monitor. Right now, you are looking at me through a oval or a circular frame. What do these things really mean? If you are looking at this particular image, you can see, you can experience distance, things moving away. How does it happen? On a flat surface, how do we perceive distance? This is another intriguing question which you would be asking yourselves or the concept of illusion where or a paradox for that matter where the relationship between inside and outside is confused. If at some point of time this is the foreground and these clouds are the background, if you move in this direction at this point this is the background and this which apparently was clouds a little earlier is the foreground. So, these are again issues uh, which are interesting, problematic 
uh, exciting and in this session and the next session we will be focusing on some of these aspects of things. More interestingly we will be also looking at how is it that we, we experience uh, the world of visuals and we will be having a number of exciting interactive let us say surveys and activities through which together we will try to find out how we do it. So, I am sure that uh, you will find it interesting and I definitely implore all of you to do those surveys because they are going to be very exciting. The findings are also going to be equally exciting when we uh, together share whatever we have learnt about how we experience visuals, how e visuals uh, manipulate our understanding of meaning and we get it linked to some of the other things which will happen later like persuasion, manipulation and all those kinds of things which is very much a significant component of advertising which is essentially dominantly either visual if it is a print, uh, print media, if it is a tabloid, if it is print media or it is dominantly multimedia if it is anything else like the television, the computer screen and so on and so forth. Now, here for instance uh, you have something which is again known as illusion. and these, this line looks much larger than the line below. Why does it happen? And these are questions that we might answer as we proceed. However, before we go into the visuals and the way that uh, visuals make sense for us which is what uh, we will be doing in the next session, we let us get a basic understanding about visual culture because as I told you a little earlier visual culture is something which has dominated at the 20th part uh, the last part of the 20th century and right now we are in the midst of visual and multimedia culture. I will just start off with a small anecdote 18 years back when I joined this institute at some point of time I heard about uh, a VGA card being installed somewhere and this gave us a glimpse into actually being able to record, edit and modify videos and to generate animations. In those days it was a very very exciting thing and in our entire institute maybe there were just one or two places where this facility was available. Now let us come fast forward 18 plus years and look at our generation next mobiles and we find that the entire concept of generating an image, manipulating that image, editing that image is uh, rather generating a motion motion picture. So, generating an animation or gen, uh, generating a video and manipulating and playing around with that video using that small device is something which is a child's play even our young kids can do that. So, the technology has significantly come forward and is rapidly exponentially increasing and growing and there must be some underlying reasons for that. So, in today's talk which will be slightly uh, brief it will be brief compared to the next one where we will be elaborating uh, the things that we saw just a few minutes back. We will be asking these questions as to what is happening in today's culture which is to begin with visual and gradually becoming more and more multimedia. So, some of the statements that I am making over here based on the ideas evolved by many theorists who talk about visual culture are uh, some of these concepts we will just quickly touch upon and let us see what they tell us about ourselves. One of the things that happens is that modern life takes place on screen. What exactly does it mean? It means that our experience of the visual to a very great extent is mediated or interfaced by either a television screen, a computer screen or a digital mobile screen or whatever. So, we experience the visual directly through our eyes, but to a much greater extent we are spending time by looking at the screen and experiencing various other kinds of visuals which obviously we would not have access to uh, sitting over here through the screens. So, TV screen, PC screen, real life and there is a Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon strip where you see that uh, one of these small tiny characters, a young boy spends the entire day watching TV and then the evening he goes out and looks at the world and then makes a comment to, to the effect that the world is very much like what we see on the TV, but much less exciting and colorful. You see that this kind of a reversal is something which we are experiencing to a certain extent even today, where some of our students even in uh, 
the IIT system uh, spend a, such a huge amount of time playing games that they gradually lose touch with reality. But in any case what is reality? Reality is something which is mediated by our senses and today we find that uh, beyond our senses although they are mediated by senses, our senses again uh, have something else blocking them uh, on the way to reality which is the computer screen or various kinds of screens. So, another layer of mediation is taking place which is the mediation of the visual culture which is experiencing the reality second hand through some kind of a screen or magazine or paper or whatever. So, you see that uh, uh, Marcel McLuhan's uh, famous statement the medium is the message is something which um, uh, is to be understood uh, in the sense that different kinds of cultures depend on different modes of communication and today's culture essentially depends on the culture of um, visuals and that has its influence in the way we communicate. Now, the fact that uh, we are in a technology oriented world for instance uh, uh, makes it understandable that uh, and in a world which is busy and where using a very small screen we have to communicate our messages uh, has resulted in uh, a different kind of a language. The language of uh, texts SMS, the language of SMS where there are a lot of abbreviations, there are a lot of use of shorthand because the space is limited, the screen is limited, you are using a single fingers or maybe one single hand for writing or typing whatever. The implication is that this particular technology and this particular kind of a medium which is being used has modified the way that the message is communicated, communicated and in the process the meaning of the message to a very great extent as well. The fact that we have smileys, the fact that we have emoticons, the fact that we have images which go viral on social media tell us that images now play a very significant role. In messages which were communicated through texts now are translated into uh, image based symbols the emoticons okay, especially emotion based things. So, you see that these transformations definitely point to the fact that visuals have taken over in a significant way. <coughs> so, I have talked about mediation and uh, mediation is about something which stands between you and the reality or me and the reality. Let us say that what stands between me and uh, you today as you are listening to this talk is your computer screen or your mobile screen or whatever it is through which you are listening to this lecture. So, this mediating surface presupposes that beyond this surface there is a real me with whom you are talking and it also presupposes that beyond this screen uh, the camera at which I am looking right now there is a real you to with whom I am talking. But you see that uh, with the advent of technology we reached a point okay, where the simulation of reality became so significant okay, that you do not need a real and sometimes you are not even sure whether there is a real. So, the only reality that becomes available to us is the reality of the media ink screen. What guarantee is there that I am not a fiction? In today's digital age we can make characters okay, known as avatars in computer language which can interact with human beings. Okay. Some of our researchers are working, I am also involved in some of this work where you see that you, you try to identify the facial expressions of the person who is communicating with the computer. You have an avatar who tries to emulate or mirror those uh, responses and talk in an intelligent way. So, what it basically means is that these avatars are this computer graphic images which look so real life like are talking and what you are talking to does not really exist. So, if there is a reality beyond well what is that we do not really know that in, in that sense you see that the only reality which exists is the surface of the screen and nothing beyond that. The examples of the many fantasy movies like Godzilla. Uh, and uh, the Jurassic Park movies and all that uh, tell us about this aspect of life where beyond the simulation of reality probably there is nothing, there is the absence of reality, the surface is all the meaning that we have. So, that is what I was talking about uh, what which is known as the problem of simulacrum, this is a term to 
indicate that simulation of reality is the only reality which is sometimes presented to us because human beings have a tendency for, of searching for meaning and when we search for meaning the language or the communicating medium becomes the surface through which we try to penetrate and reach to some ultimate meaning. But in today's world very often the surface is the only meaning that is available to us. This can have bewildering in con consequences I just, as I just shared with you that some of our students uh, very few luckily are so addicted to uh, let us say multi user games that uh, they have to go for a de addiction, they have to meet psychiatrists or counsellors because they are disoriented and they live in a different world, a world which does not exist outside of uh, the realm of the television or the computer in which they are playing the game. So, these are interesting things that emerge. Here is an example of a similar crumb, absolutely life like uh, an image which looks more real than any photograph that is possible, but which is actually an animation as uh, I am sorry uh, a creation which is uh, crea it is it is a it is an illustration created using light wave weight and it is it is uh, more than almost uh, 11 or 12 years old at that point of time you find that we could generate such lifelike images which are more real than real images ok. So, now having discussed all these things if you ask the question what is visual culture then the the immense amount of visuality that we are involved with and have to interpret to make sense of make everyone from film critics to sociologists interested in it what emerges is a visual culture. Visual culture is something within which we are submerged we experience it every day of our lives without being conscious of it. However, if we develop a certain degree of sensitivity to certain aspects of visual culture then it gives us a certain insight into how we communicate through visuals and obviously, we are in a better position and we can become more effective communicators and thus it would help us with our soft skills in various ways. Now, you see that uh, as I told you a little earlier during the introduction, we will be looking at certain elements of visual culture. One of the interesting elements about contemporary visual culture is sometimes seeing is not knowing and this has direct implications relationship with the concept of simulation as well as the fact that uh, very often uh, the image is not the truth, the image can lead to deception to ellips, illusions. So, examples there are many examples uh, the smart bombs of Gulf, Gulf War uh, which uh, kind of looked like uh, uh, the, the smart Gulf, uh, bombs of Gulf War bombarded many tankers, bunkers and various kinds of things which were actually rubber uh, floats, uh, rubber blow ups. So, what basically happened was that uh, an illusion of actually destroying things was what was created in the early phase of the war and actually nothing was being destroyed. So, you see that if, if you are if you are even if you do not go this far if you are looking at just the newspaper and the television when we see something through the heightened intense color and drama of the television reports and the newspaper reporters or the television reporters dramatizing it just to draw our attention the kind of reality which is painted may not have much to do with the actuality which exists over there. So, you see a city being presented in a particular way and you feel that the city is very much like that, but when you go to that city you find that it is very different from what has been painted through the media screen ok, through the television to advertising and things like that. So, you see that uh, we had traditionally very strong belief that what you see is what you believe. We even have a phrase which tells us seeing is believing. On the other hand, today's reality is seeing is not believing. We live in a world of illusions. Okay? So, this becomes very, very important for us to realize. One of the other things uh, which I would like to touch upon is that someone is always watching and recording. We live in a visual culture where we are perpetually being watched this watching could relate to voyeurism to pleasure, it could relate to surveillance where people a conscious uh, citizens are watching one another capturing uh, videos of anything which is suspicious. So, that every time some untoldly thing happens in the news in the news you can see some mobile phone having captured the event may be a crash of a plane or whatever. So, perpetually everywhere visuals are being documented with our knowledge and without our knowledge. 
So, our, we are not only visible, uh, we kind of exp indulge in this visibility and we, we, we use it in two different ways, one for pleasure in visualizing ourselves and visualizing others and the other one is for surveillance in watching ourselves and in watching others. Okay. So, this has interesting implications. Now, you find that uh, seeing is related to power and knowledge because in the earlier tradition you see that visibility of things if you are in a position to see things uh, you are powerful, but more important in the earlier tradition if other people see you they get an idea about your power. So, you find that uh, the huge buildings, huge monuments which were built, if you are talking about the Egyptian Sphinx, if you are looking at the Kutab Mina, if you are looking at Taj Mahal, display of grandeur, display of things which are very significant, which are powerful, which are big. On the other hand, in today's culture, another kind of power has come, the power of watching others without yourself being watched you have uh, various kinds of surveillance cameras almost everywhere today. Today, you can even get a surveillance camera uh, for 4 to 5000 rupees, which you can place inside your home to watch maybe a specific room and what is happening there. So, this ability to be invisible yourself while watching others is a new kind of a power, which has suddenly emerged as very, very powerful. If you remember uh, H. G. Wells story about the invisible man you would also realize that in that particular novel, the man after his invisibility turns evil, because invisibility gives him an immense amount of power. When nobody can see him, nobody can see him do things which you see that in a, in a society would be taboo, some things which somebody would stop him from doing. And the same thing is taken forward into uh, films uh, when we have the hollow man, where the same thing is again repeated how invisibility leads to power and power leads to evil. So, that dimension of things is also something which is very much there. However, I would like to quickly share with you that such a tradition is fairly recent maybe last 40 to 50 years. Prior to that we had a tradition of texts where texts dominated and images were subservient and still before that if you are looking at the Indian tradition we had a we had a strong de dependency, if you are looking at the very early tradition on Shruti, on hearing, on the auditory senses, on memory, remembering by listening to things and memorizing things. And you find that it was in that tradition that the Vedas were transmitted by word of mouth known as the oral tradition. So, that was a tradition where things happened in a different way. In a oral tradition, history uh, got, uh, I would say, transmuted, transformed into wisdom which was timeless, uh, temporal. So, we have a lot of difficulty in identifying dates when we look our ancient scriptures, even stories, uh, history if you can call it history or itihas if you can call it that. It is very difficult because if the, in the oral tradition, uh, uh, the absence of written documents and dating and other kinds of I mean techniques were not considered significant. On the other hand, if you are looking at the written tradition of the Greeks, there you find a distinctive uh, temporal approach to things, where time and a linear time where things happen one after the other are documented systematically and we have a strong sense of uh, history, the European sense of history, which is essentially a linear chronicle of what events happen one after the other. On the other hand, if you are looking at the Indian tradition, it is a tradition of recurrence so, the points which are noted down, points which are jotted down are not unique, but the ones which are persistent, which are cyclic, which will come back and again and again, uh, dealing, leading in the direction of wisdom that these things are within quotes universal, which persist. So, having talked about that, let us quickly talk about a few other things. The first being seeing versus visualizing. When I see something, that thing has to be visual, that is I am seeing you, I am seeing the camera, I am seeing the PowerPoint right now. This is seeing, but if let us say that uh, the heart is experienced, okay, uh, where uh, the heart beats are translated into waves or if the various activities of the brain are translated into waves, then you see that 
uh, other senses are getting transferred into visuals. So, what exactly is happening over here? We find that things which are not visual are also translated into visuals. The heartbeat is not a visual thing, but we visualize things which are not visual. So, the difference between seeing and visualizing I hope becomes clear here. We live in a culture where almost everything we tend to visualize. All the medical devices use various kinds of things like ultrasound and other kinds of uh, technologies so that we can finally see some kind of a graph or an image. Then brain scanning methods do that and EG or ECG record the measure the different impulses whether they are vibrations or their electrical impulses as I have already shown you on the screen. So, this is the difference between this is where you see that visuals have today become so slow dominant that we are visualizing or translating into visuals things which are not necessarily visual. The computer screen and the entire technology behind it is in fact an example of that because when windows came uh, prior, prior to that we had DOS we had we had inputs which were textual inputs, but with windows we had visual inputs we had iconic inputs and that kind of totally transformed the way that computers came down from the high citadels of uh, universities and have become so commonplace so powerful that even the youngest of kids uses a processor and a machine which is maybe a uh, hundred or a thousand times as powerful as some of the early machines of the 1960s and 70s which used to take up many rooms in universities where computational computer science was being taught. Now, another thing which I would like to bring to your notice is that if you are looking at the recent past, we find that we lived in a textual kind of a society, a society which dominantly predominantly was text oriented. The hangover of it is still there, we still communicate a lot with te texts, but the way that we communicate with texts is gradually changing it is becoming more visually oriented as I told you a little earlier, it is becoming abbreviated and grammatical a new kind of text is emerging in this world. Earlier if you are looking at the early part of the 20th century even way beyond that into the 16th 17th century, the illustration was a supplement to the text, today the text is a supplement to the illustration, uh, sorry the illustration was uh, uh, a supplement to the text yes, the text is a supplement to the illustration. So, here is an example of a poem by William Blake and uh, you can see the poem over here and you have illustrations. Obviously, the poem is very important and you have this printed elsewhere and the illustration is what you find uh, is uh, incidental even without the illustration you can read the poem. But look at this particular advertisement by Kelvin Klein where you see that the only thing that is highlighted is the watch and nothing else the text is subservient. So, the roles have been substituted. So, let us take a case study of two advertisements to make this point little more elaborately. If you are looking at this 1925 advertisement uh, of Lux, then you find that there is a huge amount of text. The text is in the form of a narrative, a storytelling and the illustrations supplement the story. What happened to Thomas Edison, the young Thomas Edison is elaborated over here. On the other hand, if you are looking at the 1980s, you find that the image dominates and the text is just one line and the small text is something which you cannot read. So, what a significant amount of difference has happened today and uh, if you are looking at the spot ads today, most of them tell stories. Okay and uh, certain things related to the advertisement we will not discuss here, but the point that I am trying to make is that visuals and then multimedia dominant and spot ads dominate today and in many cases even the print ads kind of refer to the spot ads. So, if you have seen the spot ad, if you are looking at the print ad, you will be able to make sense of it. That is the degree of linkage between a print and the multimedia that happens today in our daily lives. The other interesting thing about visuals today is interactivity. We can interact with the visual and the visual can be animated, uh, getting an additional dimension to it. Even texts can be animated thus uh, developing a visual quality about them and uh, 
you see that uh, interactivity has become a key motor. So, this is another dimension of the visual culture today that the visual is not passive uh, as it was in the 1980s or 90s. Today, it is something where you see that interactivity uh, is very, very important. You are able to pause or play, you are able to repeat whatever I am I am speaking right now. You are able to stop it, go to go back to another lecture or move forward to another lecture. This interactivity, the, the playfulness of the entire thing in a visual medium is another distinctive feature which we find in the visual culture today. Now, you see that uh, I would like to touch upon just a few other issues quickly, one of them being that the image is everything today. The image in the early traditions was holy, sacred, sanctified and precious portraits used to be painted, then came photography which mechanized the entire process and today you see that uh, even the process of photography and the delay in developing a photograph is no longer there. Photographs have become instant, they are captured instantly, they are transmitted instantly. So, the image has become a part of everyday life. The text earlier was a part of everyday life very often people used to take notes. Today, I find that many people start recording either the, through use of audio or video a talk which is taking place rather than taking notes, rather than listening carefully where memory plays an important role. So, you see that that is where we are moving, we are, that is the direction in which we are moving. I will skip this, uh, you can see it in the slide that the functions have been transformed. Okay. From holy, it has become commonplace, from sacred, it has become ordinary these changes have taken place. But the last point I would like to make is that in this particular context uh, the, the matrix trilogy kind of drives from the point uh, of taking us to an extreme where somebody lives in the world of actuality. What I am trying to share you with you friends is that the visual world has gradually given way to the virtual world and we have started immersing in the virtual world being in an I, being in the IIT system, being, in a, being a part of one of the oldest IITs in the country, we are getting exposed to new technologies and people coming uh, with concepts of immersive technologies, which even they are planning to set up in different places, which implies that you live in a virtual world or a virtual world is created for you. For instance, we are exploring that for our Nehru Museum, uh, where you see that uh, your experience of the, the visual or the experience of the virtual is so lifelike that you forget that it is a virtual medium, you become immersed in that virtual medium. This is the Im new immersive technology which is coming, something which uh, is shown in its most mature and extreme form in a film, in a movie like The Matrix, where you see that your virtual identity and your real identity cannot really be segregated or separated. It is fine that uh, we need, uh, we are aware of these issues, we are aware of uh, these very interesting dimensions of visual and from visual the virtual culture, but it is also very important to know that uh, these are leading us inevitably in a direction uh, which is very, very different from the, the world that uh, we experienced as young kids and uh, the more we proceed, the more we move in the direction of an immersive world. However, how to make sense of this immersive world, how to make sense of this visual world, how to play around with it, experience it, manipulate it to make for more effective communication, more impressive communication is something which we will touch upon in the next talk. Thank you.